without further ado, it's a lovely pleasure to welcome uh, Catherine Brading as our final speaker. Uh, Catherine did her DPhil at Oxford some years ago, um, at the same time roughly as, as me, and uh, it was a great pleasure to, to be a, a sort of DPhil student at the same time. She did pioneering work on NERTA with uh, her supervisor Harvey Brown at the time, and uh, more recently has been working on uh, moving back in time to the, to the early modern period as today, talking about uh, Du Chatelet. Um, Catherine was at Notre Dame for many years, but is now a professor at uh, Duke University. Catherine, it's lovely to have you. Thank you. Um, so nice to be back. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here and to see so many old friends and new people. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, some work that comes from a joint project with Marius Stan. We have this project on um, 18th century physics, um, mathematics, mechanics, philosophy, and the intersection um, between them. And I'm going to try and pull out a thread from this, which currently consists really of three distinct chunks that for me all hang together, and I hope they'll hang together in this talk, but at least we'll have interesting things to talk about afterwards, I hope. Um, so I will get started if I can make the slides move along. Um, let's see. <laughs> uh, How many philosophers of physics does it take? To mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what did you press? I just made the cursor on that rather than zoom, I think. Okay, all right, great. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna start with a quote that's probably familiar to many of you. It's this lovely place where Leibniz has a bit of a rant against Newtonian gravitation. This is from the Leibniz Clark correspondence. And he says, but then what does he mean, he, Newton, when he will have the sun to attract the globe of the earth through an empty space? Is it God himself that performs it? But this would be a miracle if ever there was any. That means of communication, says he, is invisible, intangible, not mechanical. You might as well have added inexplicable, unintelligible, <laughs> precarious, groundless, and unexampled. So it's not happy, obviously. <laughs> if the means which causes an attraction properly so called be constant and at the same time inexplicable by the powers of creatures and yet be true, it must be a perpetual miracle. And if it is not miraculous, it is false. It is a chimerical thing, a scholastic occult quality. So the contrast here is between Newtonian or action at a distance and mechanical collisions. And the idea is that collisions are thoroughly intelligible. This is, you know, what's at the heart of the new mechanical philosophy and the claim that this philosophy is superior to what's come before because it's straightforwardly intelligible. Collisions, impacts are intelligible, whereas this action at a distance is not. Um, so, yeah. Yes, all right. Um, so move on a little bit. Um, this is Mopatree, and he's putting into writing um, a worry that is, has been brewing for a while by the time he writes, and that is, well, what makes um, action by impact any more intelligible than action at a distance? So here's what he writes in 1732. He says, the common people are not at all surprised when they see a body in motion communicate its motion to others. But being used to this sight, they see nothing wonderful in it. But come to the philosophers, the philosophers who are resolute enough to decide a priori concerning what properties are to be admitted in bodies and what excluded. Such philosophers, I say, cannot conceive the impulsive force more conceivable than the attractive. What is this impulsive force? How does it reside in bodies? Who could have imagined it to have been resident therein before he had seen the shock or congress of bodies? So he's raising this issue, how do we make sense of um, impact? Um, so we move forward now to Du Chatelet in 1740, and I take it in her text that she um, gives the most kind of worked out and thorough attempt to address this problem and to make um, impact intelligible. And I'll talk in a little bit um, about that and try and kind of, kind of give you a picture of the account of what it would mean at this point in history. Um, to make collisions intelligible, what that looks like, a version of it. So that's where we're going to go. But before we do that, 
Um, I just want to put a bit of background in place. So this round of discussion about collisions is part of a, a bigger discussion, um, asking questions such as how, if at all, do the collision rules? So the collision rules of Huygens, Ren and Wallace go back to the 1660s. They've been around for some time, but there are still ongoing discussions about how to make sense of them. So how do these rules follow from the nature and properties of bodies, if at all? What's the nature of bodies that makes gravitational motion possible? So is it the case that bodies have gravity as a property? Is it an essential property if so? Or is that just a mistake? Do bodies have other properties through which they give the behaviors that are the gravitational behaviors, perhaps, perhaps through vortex theory of motion or something? So what's the nature of bodies such that they move around and act on one another in accordance with the theory of motion that's coming out of mechanics? So this is also a time, as we'll see, when mechanics is really moving forwards with going beyond statics and adding motion into the theories, that, the mathematical theories that are being developed. Um, so this problem, kind of big umbrella question, what's a body and how could we know? Um, this is really central to physics and mechanics at the time. And I'll say a, bit, a little bit more about that in a minute. And this is what the book that I mentioned with Marius um, is about, and we call it Philosophical Mechanics in the Age of Reason, and it will be done this summer. See about that, yeah. Um, so first of all, then, just a little bit of background just to make sure that we have all these things that are all on the same page about this, and then I'll talk about Du Chatelet. Um, so first of all, physics in the 18th century was still a part of philosophy, it was still a sub-discipline of philosophy. Um, and it was that subdiscipline that was charged with providing the general account of bodies, by which was meant you need to say what the nature of bodies is, what the properties of bodies are, the causes, effects, and behaviors of bodies. So physics gives the general account, and then there are other areas of philosophy that can be responsible for discussing specific kinds of bodies. Your physics is the subject matter of physics is the general theory of bodies. Um, this was distinct from mechanics. So this is a time when Mechanics was a subdiscipline of mathematics, and physics, by and large, was um, practiced by one set of people, and mechanics was practiced by another distinct um, set of people. And physics and mechanics takes bodies as its subject matter, abstracting away from some of the properties to just have those properties that are relevant for developing the mathematical theory, and then away, away you go. But if you're working in mechanics, you take for granted that there are bodies and that physics has an account of bodies and that you can do that. You can just pick the properties you want and then go ahead and do your, um, mathemat do your mathematical theory. So physics is responsible for saying what bodies are. So we have these two disciplines that by and large are done by different people and have different standards for what we're supposed to be doing, what problems we're solving, what counts as success. Um, then a third important piece of background is that at this point, Everyone who's doing physics still agrees that collisions are um, a fundamental means of bodily action, of the ways in which bodies act on one another. So even if you're a Newtonian and you think action at a distance is another way in which bodies act on one another, in the early 18th century, you also still think that um, contact action is a means of bodies acting on one another. It's not until later in the century that we get people um, doing everything by means of action at a distance forces. So everyone thinks that collisions are really important, and this <coughs> made collision theory the focus of intense research in the early decades of the 18th century. Um, so with that background in place, um, I'm just going to tighten things up a little bit. Um, so when you look at the work that people are doing on the nature of bodies, everybody is looking for their collision theory. Um, and the question to be answered seems to be this, what's the nature of bodies such that they can undergo collisions? So what properties do we have to ascribe to bodies in order for them to be capable of, of having one body that collides into another and these two things survive the collision process and behave, move around in accordance with the rules of collision? So the task was to integrate the rules of collision, which are taken from mechanics, into an account of the material constitution of bodies. Um, and this yields the putting together of these two things is this label that Marius and I use. It's, a, it's anachronistic um, of philosophical mechanics. So it comes from a text much later in the century. But we like it um, because it captures this idea. And you see this happening in different areas of philosophy and physics at the same time, 
um, of people trying to put together mathematical results with some kind of theory of material constitution to get a single account of the behaviors um, in particular circumstances of different kinds of material entities. Um, so what you see is physicists working on nature of bodies. Um, in order to have a satisfactory account of bodies, you need to have an account where those bodies um, satisfy the rules of collision and are adequate for the purposes of collision theory. So having such an account of bodies, being able to answer this question becomes a necessary condition on any adequate account of the nature of bodies coming out of physics. All right, so we can, I can have lots of questions about that, but I wanna just put that on the table and take it for granted so that we can move forward and talk about, first of all, Emily du Chatelet. Um, so in 1740, she published her book, um, The Foundations of Physics. And in this text, she does something that's quite unusual for the time. And she has a look at all the different kind of works being, doing in, in, being done in physics at the time, whether that's broadly in a Cartesian tradition or Leibnizian tradition or Newtonian tradition. And she tries to kind of identify, okay, here are the most important problems. Here are the best resources that we have for trying to address those problems. And here's how we might move theorizing forward. And this sounds very much like um, the kind of work a philosopher of physics would do. I like this description that she gives in the introduction. I think this is a very nice way of thinking um, about one of the kinds of things that philosophers of physics like to do. So she says, physics is an immense building that surpasses the powers of a single man. Some lay a stone there while others build whole wings. Still others survey the plan of the building and I among them. So this is how she thinks of herself, what she's doing. She's just looking at everything that's going on in physics. She's looking at the foundations. She, she builds on this metaphor, but are the foundations secure? How do the different parts fit together? Do we end up with a cohesive whole? Of course, there's one bit gonna fall down because another bit isn't done right, that kind of thing. So that's her kind of picture of what she's doing. And within this, one of the things she does um, is to investigate the nature and properties of bodies, unsurprisingly, given what um, I was just saying, and the ways in which they act on one another. So she looks at both contact action and gravitation, these being the two main candidates around at the time. Here is her strategy. She says the way that she proceeds is, first of all, we ascertain the nature and properties of bodies. We then reason from those to the general laws of motion. And then with those two things in place, we can then reason from there to an account of collision processes. So here's what she says about the nature and properties of bodies. So like everybody at the time, she thinks that bodies are extended. So the first property she attributes to bodies is extension, so shape and size. But then like many others at the same time, she also thinks that this is by itself insufficient to, to explain the behaviors of bodies. So she thinks, look, if you've got just a piece of extension, then if it's gonna be acted upon, it needs to be able to resist that action or there can't be any action. And if it's gonna act on something else, it needs to have more than extension to be able to act on something else. So very much in a Leibnizian kind of tradition, she attributes passive force to bodies and also active force. So the passive force is that by which bodies change, resist changes in the state of motion and the active force is that by which one body acts on another. So she's just looking at, you know, what do we need to have in order to have an adequate concept of body in which we have bodies that are engaged in causal interactions in which they genuinely act on one another. These, this is what we need. So that's the first, the first step is to talk about the nature and properties of bodies. Having done that, we can then build up towards the laws of motion. So she starts talking about what it means to have these kinds of bodies. She says a body at rest, given the properties that we've just attributed to bodies, will never begin to move by itself. Since all matter is endowed with passive force by which it resists motion, it cannot move by itself. This is all a quote from her. In order, in order for motion to happen with sufficient reason, there must be a cause that sets this body in motion. Thus, any bodies at rest would forever stay at rest if some cause did not set them in motion. By the same principle of sufficient reason, a moving body would never cease to move if some cause did not stop its motion, consuming its force, blah, blah, blah. And then the active and passive forces of bodies is modified by their impact uh, according to certain laws that can be reduced to three principles. So she's kind of arguing her way to, to Newton's first law of motion. 
And you can have all sorts of problems with this argument. What I care about for the purposes of today is just the strategy that she's using, the way that we're going to get to our account of collisions. Um, it's like this. So we've said that the active and passive forces of bodies are going to be modified by impact. So she's restricting herself, given her account of the nature of bodies and how they can act on one another. It's only by contact. So the first law, the laws of motion, this is her version of Newton's laws of motion. Um, they, what they're going to do is um, tell you how active and passive force are modified when bodies um, contact with one another. So we get her version of the first and second and third law. Um, it's not unusual at the time, Newton's laws weren't widely um, accepted in there. Um, in the precise formulation that she had, lots of people worried about them. It's not unusual for people to change how they're worded and adapt them for their own purposes. But this is her version of the laws. And a key thing that I want to highlight is that in her text, these are not taken as axioms. Right? We don't state them at the beginning and then solve problems using them. We have to argue for them. We build up to them first by giving an account of the nature of bodies and then saying, given that that's the nature of bodies, here's what the laws are going to look like. Um, so they're explained and justified on the basis of the prior account of bodies, and also, as I mentioned, um, they're specifically limited to impact. So we've got our bodies, from there we get our laws, and from there we move on to being able to explain um, collisions. So this is the case she gives of head-on collisions. Um, it's generalizable, but the idea is that you've got these two bodies, A and B, so they come into contact with one another. When they're pressing on one another, their living force is now um, dead force because they're not moving. Um, as they press on one another, this is kind of using up their, their active force. All of the active force in body, and they say the second body gets used up. There's more active force in this one. So the dead force now, they're starting to move, transitions into living force. Um, and by means of its passive force, this body then resists. So we're telling this story of what's going on during the collision process. Um, and that's what's supposed to make the collisions intelligible. Right? We can tell this sort of causal explanatory story in terms of the properties of bodies um, that make it intelligible that they behave in the ways they do when we have collisions. And then we can use the laws of motion um, to give a quantified account of this, the laws of motion, we also kind of got our way to somehow on the basis of the nature of bodies, and this gets us to the rules of collision. So I'm going through this very fast. You can spend, you know, we can spend time on having problems with it at many, many steps. But the point of putting this in front of you is to say it seems like it seems very natural to think of this um, as a kind of constructive approach. To collisions. Right? If we think of this terminology of constructive and principal approaches, which um, is familiar from Harvey's work, it's due to Einstein. Um, so it's kind of anachronistic to use it in this context. Um, but I think it's a really useful distinction. And you know, it didn't come out of nowhere with Einstein using this terminology of constructive theory versus principal theory. And it turns out, I think, that taking this as a tool and for the purposes of the kinds of questions I have about the 18th century at least, looking at some of the events in the 18th century is really helpful, gives us a way of thinking about the theorizing and just thinks, looking at the way in which this interplay between constructive approach and a principal approach to theorizing kind of moves theorizing forwards and the circumstances in which it's appropriate to think constructively and the circumstances in which it's appropriate to think of principal theories. So if we think of a constructive theory as being one that builds up from the natures of the objects of whatever our theory is about, that's what this looks like. Right? We're going to explain the collision behavior in terms of the nature and properties of bodies. We're going to explain why rules of collision hold on the basis of the nature and properties of bodies. So I think it's natural to read, to kind of categorize um, what Du Chatelet was doing in this way. And it turns out that this way of approaching collision theory is very, very widespread in the first half of the 18th century. And so you can look at people from you know, broadly different traditions of the Cartesian, Leibnizian, Newtonian, and everyone's doing it. So there are some examples here of places, so Malebranche and Leibniz correspondence, there's a couple of prize competitions, the Paris Academy on collisions in the 1720s that are after this, you know, what's the causal story of what's going on with collisions all the way through to Euler 
1750. And exactly what those constructive accounts looks like varies depending on the kind of epistemology and the kind of commitments that um, the different people have as they're working on this, but they're all very similar in having this approach that first we need to say something about the nature of bodies, and from there, we're gonna get our rules of collision. It also continued in a slightly different form um, in the second half of the century, in fact, all the way through. Um, I'm not gonna say anything um, more about that because what I'm trying to get across is that given the conception of physics at the time, given this idea that the role of physics is to provide the general account of bodies, you can see why a constructive approach would dominate, right? So if you're working, you're a philosopher, you're working in physics, if you can show, given your account of the nature of bodies, that you can recover the laws of motion, so these have been shared between physics and mechanics since Newton's Principia. So if you can recover those laws or your version of the laws from the nature of bodies, and that you can explain the rules of collision in terms of the nature and properties of bodies, then you've kind of done your job. You've done what you were supposed to do. You've provided an account of bodies that's adequate for the purposes of mechanics. If people in mechanics can now pick up the notion of body and get on to doing what they're doing, feeling confident, whatever the philosophers go on to do talking about bodies that idea of body that concept of body is adequate for whatever the people in mechanics need it for um, so that is the kind of picture of things at this point in the century um, yeah i think i said all of that so yeah this constructive approach then dominates in these early the early decades of the 18th century so now i want to move on to the kind of second chunk of material, um, which is to say, to try and show that in the middle decades of the 18th century, the situation in mechanics changed in a way that has really big consequences for the people working in physics, for the philosophers, and thereby I think, ultimately for the relationship between physics as it was then understood and mechanics, and for physics as we understand it today, for the emergence of physics as this mathematical discipline um, as we understand it today. So there are three really important things that happened in mechanics. I want to talk about those and then kind of take us, to kind of follow that thread and see where that takes us with respect to thinking about bodies and the objects of physics and what are the objects of physics? How do we know what they are? Um, so one thing that happened was that it became to seem to people working in mechanics increasingly that Newton's laws are just not adequate for treating extended bodies. And um, they were searching for new principles that would meet this challenge. I'll say a bit more about this in a minute. Secondly, it was increasingly clear to people that collisions are a complex problem from the perspective of mechanics. So you have the Huygens, Ren, Wallace rules of collision. They make some very specific idealizations in terms of the uniform mass distribution, the spherical shape, point contact, various other things, relaxing those idealizations, those restrictions on the validity of the laws was turning out to be very, very problematic. So collisions are appearing as this very difficult problem and we need to situate them way downstream. We have a lot of other stuff we need to solve first before we can um, have a, a properly developed theory of collisions. And then the third thing that happens in mechanics is that it becomes clear that a general theory of the motions of extended bodies rather than just point particles is gonna need a, a treatment of constrained motion. And it's that that's going to kind of shift, also shift from where kind of the philosophical interest lies, where the theorizing is most important um, to the kinds of questions that I'm interested in about the subject matter of physics. It's this that's going to um, give us a big, big problem. And the upshot is going to be that the theory of constrained motions becomes the most important place where research is being done that's relevant to this question of, well, what is a body um, and how, how can we know? Um, so that's what I'm going to try and give some indication of now. <laughs> um, so just very quickly, where we have a small bit of evidence for this first claim that Newton's laws were thought not to be adequate for treating extended bodies and the new principles would be needed. The most important text here is um, Euler from 1736. So prior to 1736, there'd been piecemeal um, solutions to very different problems, to 
to a variety of different problems and different people solving different problems using different principles and Euler tries to pull all this together in 1736 in his Mechanica where he set out a general research program sorry a research program for a general mechanics of bodies in motion and at the end of um, book one um, he says he sets out the position as he understood it at the time and as, as was becoming clear from the work that people were doing. So he says, Newton's first law holds for indefinitely small bodies, which can be considered as points when they're just left to themselves. But for bodies of finite magnitude of which the individual parts have their own motions, so bodies where you've got different parts that are connected to one another and so constrained to move with them, no matter what forces are applied to them, your body will exert itself to observe these laws but it will not always be possible for the law to hold for these bodies due to the state of the body. And he says, motions of such bodies have, yet, have not yet been treated in the history of mechanics due to the insufficiency of the principles. So his diagnosis of this issue that we just don't seem to be able to solve problems involving extended bodies, except for the special cases where we can treat them by means of a representative point there's a fairly limited number of those that are solved at this point in history, except for those we seem to lack the principles that we need. And what Newton's giving us doesn't seem to be enough to solve these problems. That's his diagnosis. Um, in order to address this, we're going to carry out a systematic research program. And Euler sets out the different steps of this research program. And the first is where we began just with bodies that can be considered as points where their motions are satisfactorily treated by just picking a representative point in the body and tracking that and that will give you their motions from there we can move to finite size rigid bodies from there to finite size flexible bodies then to bodies that can have change of both shape and size and finally once we've done all that we can get to motions that are impeded by other bodies so we can get at last to collisions so this is this point about collisions being way down downstream and then to fluids. And very importantly, oil has these big two volumes of mechanics from 1736 and they only attempt item one. So the takeaway from this is despite all the kind of promise of Newton's Principia, mechanics is turning, the motions of bodies turning out to be really, really hard. It's a mathematical challenge that is extremely, extremely difficult. Um, so here's the third kind of prong of this um, challenge that's coming out of mechanics, and that is in order to proceed, in order to get ourselves from the treatment of point particles to the treatment of extended bodies, we're going to have to develop a theory of constrained motion. We, the parts of an extended body are constrained to move together, so as I was mentioning before, whatever forces are applied to one part, that part's not free to move in accordance with Newton's second law because it's tied. It's to these other parts of the body. So something's gonna happen. It's not just gonna be F equals MA. Um, so in practice, the way that this gets tackled within mechanics in the first half of the 18th century is by means of these internal constraints. So what we've just talked about, the constraints that hold bodies together. So given an extended body subject to internal constraints, how does it move? Um, we have some, solutions for this by means of representative points, but there are lots of this, that's just for a limited class of systems. And there's lots more that we're gonna to try to do by means of that strategy. And we also want to know for each of the parts, how those parts move. We don't only want to have a representative point for the overall trajectory. We'd like to know how the parts individually move. Um, and then secondly, external constraints. So to get ourselves into a position to be able to do this, um, there are puzzles to be solved where we think about given an external body that's impeded in its motion, so it can't, has a force acting on it, but it can't do the acceleration, the direction of the force, perhaps because it's a bead on a wire, and still picture, um, how's it gonna move? How, we, how can we want a general theory of the motions of bodies that are subject to external constraints? So this is where the mathematicians are going, you know, trying to solve these kinds of problems, and we can see, why they're relevant if you have this question of what's a body, then all of this stuff is going to be important to you. Um, because if a body is an extended thing, it's got its parts, they're constrained to move together. Um, so now where before the problem of collisions was 
something you had to solve. You needed to provide bodies that were capable of undergoing collisions and obeying the collision rules. Now you've got a much harder problem. Right? Now the question becomes, what's the nature of bodies such that they can be the object of a general mechanics? So a general theory of the motions of bodies, one with all the constraint theory that's part of it. Um, so if you're your philosopher sitting there and thought, well, I have the Huygens Ren rules of collision, I understand those. I know how to recover those. Now you're looking over and looking at all this mathematics. Now you have a much, it's just much more challenging for philosophers to be able to meet this condition and to know that they're meeting that condition. So if we want to look for where this condition might be met, um, we're not really going to be able to turn to the philosophers. And there are various reasons for this. One is that the education system was such that most of them just weren't trained in the mathematics to be able to follow what was happening in mechanics. Um, so there are sort of some institutional reasons. People were in different houses in different institutions. They didn't get the opportunity to talk to each other, these kinds of things. Um, but partly it's just too hard. Um, so let's have a look at D'Alembert because I think, so his treatise is from 1743, so this is just three years after Du Chatelet's Foundations of Physics. Um, and he's looking at this arena, he's very familiar, he's familiar with Du Chatelet's work, he's familiar with what the, with Euler's work, with the Bernoullis, all the people who are working in mechanics, and he produced, you know, Euler had these two quick big volumes that didn't get, you know, that were systematically working through stuff, but just dealing with points. Um, point particles. Dalibar has this little treatise about that fact um, where he tries to encompass everything. His goal is to say, look, we need to simplify things, we need to have clarity about what our object is, we need to have clarity of principles, and we need to have this general treatment of all possible systems. So what I want to do now is to spend the rest of the time thinking about um, Dalibar's treatise. So what we've had so far is the dominant approach up to the middle of the century as these constructive approaches coming out of physics. The next thing was to say, oh, really hard problems coming out of mechanics that are absolutely central, just being able to solve this problem of what is the body and how does it move and how do we know these things. Difficult material coming out of mechanics, challenging the standard way of doing things from the physicists. Now I want to look at D'Alembert's treatise and suggest that we can read his treatise both is offering a constructive approach, and we can also put a different hat on and read it from a kind of principle approach. And in both ways, we're gonna get some really kind of philosophical interest out of this. It's gonna help us in trying to understand, okay, what are the objects of D'Alembert's theory? What are, what's the subject matter of his theory? What is theory about? So that's what we're trying to understand. If his theory is not just mathematics, if it's applicable to systems in the world, then what are those systems? Does his theory have adequate resources to say what bodies are or what those systems are and so forth? Um, so that's what the last part of this talk is about. Um, and I was thinking that probably um, people are not terribly familiar with his treatise. So I would start by just saying something about what's in the treatise, what the structure of the treatise is, how it works. And then we'll have a look at it constructively and then we'll have a look at it from a kind of principle approach. And then you can see what you think and whether yeah there are whether there are interesting things from the perspective of philosophy of physics coming out of this um so as i said his text is this my little book um and it consists of these parts it has a preface um where he sets out what he's trying to do in this text it gives you his epistemology um talks about yeah the kind of project this is it, that this is and then he moves on to his definitions and preliminary notions then three principles and these are kind of the axioms of his theory, which is supposed to be justified by their clarity. And from that, we get his general principle, um, which is what Lagrange picks up, does some things to, and calls D'Alembert's principle, which may be something that you're familiar with. It's not exactly what's in here. You can, there's an important element of D'Alembert's principle in here, but just we won't call it that because um, it's not quite the same thing. So he gets to his general principle, and then he tries to show the utility of this principle by solving a whole bunch of problems. Um, so now I'm just going to go through in a little bit more detail each of these parts, and then we'll have a look and see um, how we want to read how we want to read this text. Um, so there's a lot going on in the preface for our purposes. 
Um, one important part of the preface is that he's very clear about the challenge, that there's this proliferation of solutions to particular problems in mechanics going on in these early decades, and different people are solving different things by means of their own preferred principles. There's always different principles people are appealing to. And he says, and most of them are just obscure. We don't know really what they're saying. We don't know what the justification for them is. So we lack clarity in the foundations of our science. And what I'm going to do, me, Mr. Dunbar, I'm going to provide a minimum number of clear principles from which we can cover, encompass, we're looking for a word, um, so yeah, encompass as many problems as possible. Um, and his goal is to include all of mechanics under this small group of principles. So that's why we can think about it like a kind of axiomatization project. So what does he give us to work with then? What are the resources? Here are his definitions and preliminary notions cover these ideas and bodies are what I'm particularly interested in today. So he starts with his definition of body. And it looks um, very familiar, right? From the early part of the century, bodies are extended, they're impenetrable, and they're mobile. So Descartes, could be Newton, could be all sorts of people um, putting these kinds of ingredients in. They're just very, very standard for the period. But obviously these are not enough. Um, everybody's agreed at this point that just being extended, impenetrable, and mobile is not enough properties for a body. At least you need Newtonian mass or something like that, maybe. Certainly need more. Um, so not surprisingly, um, when we move on to his principles, he introduces another property of bodies. So his first principle, his first axiom is the force of inertia. And it says, this is the property bodies have for remaining in the same state of rest or of motion in a straight line. And given that property, he then thinks he can derive um, Newton's first law. And that's a whole other story. Um, his second of his three principles is composition of motion. This is um, his version of a par parallel ground rule for the addition of motions and what motion is. It's going to turn out to be interesting. And then his third principle is a principle of equilibrium. Um, so D'Alembert, like others in the period, thinks that equilibrium in statics is something that we have a clear idea of. We'll try to generalize this to, that's going to now include motions and then show that statics falls under this generalized notion of equilibrium. So it says that bodies that have equal and opposite quantities of motion are in equilibrium. And then given these three um, axioms, he then uses those to articulate his general principle that goes on to be part of D'Alembert's principle. So that's the kind of the basis on which he builds to his general principle. Those are the resources he gives himself. And then here's what his general principle says. It says, right, decompose the motions A, B, C, etc. impressed on each body. So I've got a system of bodies that are constrained to move with respect to one another. I impress some motions on them. I'm gonna decompose these into two others. So A prime alpha, B prime beta, C prime gamma, etc. And let this decomposition be such that had we impressed on the bodies only the motions A prime, B prime, C prime, etc., the bodies would have been able to conserve these motions without mutual impediment. They would move freely, or they would move without constraint. And so that's one part of the decomposition. And then the other part is such that had we impressed on them the motions alpha, beta, gamma, etc., the system would have remained at rest. It is clear that A prime, B prime, C prime will be the motions that these bodies take in virtue of the action. So the idea is that the motions of bodies subject to constraints can always be decomposed into two contributions. And this is body by body decomposition. The actual motions, and these are the free, the unconstrained motions, which are conserved by the bodies, and the equilibrium motions, and these equilibrium motions would only produce rest in the system, they're mutually destroyed. So that's how he's thinking about things. And he thinks that this here is kind of a general recipe that is satisfied by all constrained systems, by all systems in mechanics. And this is gonna enable him to solve all problems in mechanics. That's his principle. Here's what it looks like. 
in practice, and his um, treatise um, is notoriously hard to follow, his proofs. Um, but here is the first problem. It's the linear compound pendulum. So we have our hinge point here where the pendulum is suspended, A, B, and R. Those are our three um, bodies that are suspended on a single rod. It's a rod, so it's rigid. So all of these A, B, and R are gonna move together. If they weren't tied together and we put them into motion, A would move to O, B would move to Q, and R would move to T. So they wouldn't all stay in one line, but they can't move like that given the impressed motions, given the, due to the impressed motions, given the rod that constrains them to move together, they have to all stay on the rod, right? They can't, A can't go to O in the same time that B goes to Q and R goes to T, because then the rod would have to bend. So constrained motions. So we decompose our motions into the two parts of the motions, the ones that they would have had if they'd been free to move under the impressed, impressed motions and the bits. Um, that they, the, the leftover bits, as it were, sorry, the ones that they would have had, the difference between the, um, the impressed motions that they would have had had they been free to move, and the difference between that and the actual motions that they have, these differences here. So we make these decompositions, um, and this enables us to solve algebraically um, what the actual motion of the pendulum is by means of finding a representative point that moves, there's one point on here that moves freely, moves exactly as it would have done had there been no constraints, had you just impressed the motion on that point. So that's the general strategy. I feel that I didn't explain that as clearly as I would like to have done. You can come back to it if you like. Um, the idea was just to give you a sense of how he decomposes the, two, the motions, pulls them into different pieces um, diagrammatically, and then reasons algebraically using his principle um, to um, show what the actual motion is. And I've worked through this one. This one's fine. This one's not too scary. Um, later ones are more scary. Oh. <laughs> um, I just clicked on one, please. Right. Yeah. Um, so problems one to eight are all cases where you've got mass points connected by rods or by threads that are flexible. Um, and you have to solve for the different motions. This is motion four. There's a body. P and it's pulling a lot, it's going along a curved surface and it's pulling other bodies. I can't really see this very clearly, sorry. And it's pulling other bodies behind it. So you've got all these geometric constructions for the body on the curved surface, the bodies that are being pulled behind by these threads. Um, and it's kind of hard to follow the reasoning, but you can see the same pattern there. You can see that he's pulling apart these two different motions and then kind of solving algebraically. You do have to know what the impressed motions on each of the bodies are in order for this to work. So you might think this is not actually very practical. It's more just a conceptual way of thinking about kind of the structure of the system and how motions work within the system. Um, problem six um, treats a, bob, uh, a pendulum with an extended bob. Well, let me mention five first. So five is like a compound pendulum with a thread. So the thread, unlike the rod, bends through the motions, right? Changes, so it changes the angle between the different, uh, the different masses are. So it's gradually making things more and more complicated. Six, you have an extended bob. This is the first time that you get a non-composite extended body that you're being treated, that you're treating this hangs from a sus suspension point. So it's a pendulum again. And then this one treats this oval here as another extended body. And this is a case where the center of gravity is not vertically above the contact point of this oval, and, and he just asks, how would it move? Um, so there are a couple of cases here where he's treating extended shapes. And then the remaining problems, so problems seven to 14, sorry, eight to 14, um, treat collisions. So we work through these and then we get ourselves as far as trying to handle collisions. And in every case, it's the same strategy. We take the impressed motions that are assumed to be known, and we decompose them into the equilibrium motions and these destroy each other um, and the remainder of the actual and the remainder of the actual motions. So hopefully that gives you some sense of what kind of thing the general principle is, right? What it allows you, the kinds of things it would allow you to do and the kinds of things it doesn't allow you to do, like it looks really hard to solve any actual problems 
using it. Um, I seem to have covered up the thing that allows me to. All right. So I want to move very quickly on to just, well, how should we think about this? And from this perspective of rational mechanics itself, you get this really nice kind of unification of all the problems that have been solved to date. Um, he shows that he can, he can do all of them. Sometimes it's a bit more complicated by his method, but he can actually cover everything under the general principle. And he gets some generalizations of things that have been solved before as well. So this is a clear kind of achievement in mathematics. Um, but then we can also ask about how does it look from the perspective of philosophical mechanics, which would want to say something about subject matter beyond mathematics. Uh, I'm so sorry, but I can't get underneath this thing. There we go. Um, so um, we can ask ourselves, okay, what are the bodies? He started with bodies. What are these bodies um, that fall under the scope? of D'Alembert's general principle. Um, and then there are these two ways of going about trying to answer that question um, that I think kind of enable us to dig more into the text. One is to think constructively, and that's very natural, right? He starts, his very first definition is a definition of body, tells you what the properties of bodies are. He's going starting there and then moving forward. So that's one way to read it. And the other way would be to take a kind of principle approach. So let's have a look at the constructive approach first. There's this definition of bodies. As I mentioned before, we add this other property, which is kind of part of a Newtonian notion of mass. Then the equilibrium. Um, I've accidentally turned off the video. It's entirely possible. why those controls I'm somehow ended up with the controls down there which is on top of the <laughs> thank you so then we're going to add other properties this is kind of a bit of Newtonian mass then um, when he introduces the principle of equilibrium although he talks about quantities of motion those seem to incorporate some notion of mass he never explicitly introduces um, a notion of mass, but something's doing, he's got to do that kind of work for him. So just thinking about the extent to which he's able to do that um, successfully or whether that he really needs some notion of mass and we need to make it explicit. He also introduces a notion of resistance that bodies have. Um, so we can try and kind of work our way forwards to, well, what properties of bodies um, is he having to introduce as he goes along in constructing his theory? And we can continue that process. We can look at the 14 problems and have a look and see, well, what are the properties of the bodies that he actually treats in solving these problems? Can we build up, you know, can we get ourselves a constructive notion of body by looking at that? So there are some limitations in scope when we look carefully at the problems that he solves. So for the most part, his bodies are assumed to be perfectly rigid, perfectly hard. They don't change shape at all. So it's a geometric condition that they have to stay exactly the same shape. They're assumed to be non-rebounding. So um, he makes this commitment. And then later on, he says, well, here's how you might go about treating elastic bodies, given um, how I've set, given everything that I've done in my 14 problems. But they, we impose these things on bodies. So they're hard, they're non-rebounding. Um, for the most part, they're actually not um, extended. Um, so we're treating them again by means of representative points. So they are extended in that sense, but we don't have a story about how all the different parts move. We just have trajectories for the extended bodies. Um, his primary means for treating extended bodies is to construct them from point masses using massless rods or threads. And he provides a really kind of general treatment for this. So it makes it, you know, you can go up to arbitrary numbers of point masses, but as I was mentioning before, you have to know what the impressed motions are on each of these point masses in order to proceed with the um, applying his principle and doing the decomposition that he asks you to do. So it's kind of a little bit deceptive, I think, in terms of does it really allow us to construct what is made of as many little particles as we like tied together? In some sense, yes, in some sense, no. Um, so this is the kind of a thing we might do if we were trying to understand 
what are the what are the bodies um what are the properties what kinds of bodies are they that d'alembert is actually talking about and that's one approach you might take um, i think it's probably clear that um, this problem is really really difficult at this point and it's difficult for um two reasons first of all um, just the problem in mechanics itself is really difficult provide, um, developing this mathematical theory is difficult and we see that when we look at the limitations and the scope of the actual problems that D'Alembert solved, despite his claims to complete generality. But we wanted to do more, right? We wanted to not just solve the problems mathematically, we wanted to give an account of the nature of bodies that are the objects of mechanics. And that's going to be really difficult. You know, D'Alembert himself, you know, starts by um, trying to say explicitly what properties those bodies have. But the more we move through things, the more we find out about which additional properties there have to be, what restrictions there are. Um, it's just really tricky um, to say what these, what these bodies are. So although attempting a constructive approach um, to the objects of his theory, I think it's not unreasonable. It's what physics would have expected at the time. Um, it's what Boscovich tried to do. Um, you see him trying to provide an account of bodies that fits with the three axioms of D'Alembert's theory. Um, it's faces significant obstacles, I think. It's just maybe just not the right way of proceeding, given the point of theorizing that we're at at this point in time. Maybe it's just not the right way to go about um, thinking about your theory at the time. And then the alternative um, would be, I'm gonna skip over this and just move on and see the time, um, to take a principle approach. Or one other way of trying to think about this would be to take the principal approach. And I like this, this distinction. I think it gives us a helpful way of kind of getting ourselves into thinking about what's going on um, in D'Alembert's treatises in a way that can help us think about um, what the subject matter of the theory is. So D'Alembert's general principle has some features that we would expect from a principal theory, right? It's intended to be universal. It's intended to cover everything. And it's intended, and the way that it's expressed here is completely independent of the particular material constitution of the systems in question. Um, so there's nothing in the statement of the general principle, set aside the three um, principles used to articulate it first. There's nothing in here that depends on any particular material system. And it does this thing that's really nice about principle theories is that it um, kind of allows us to bracket off a whole bunch of dynamical questions and stick them in the, stick them in the kinematics, right? Saying, I don't care how all this arises, it just is the case that these equilibrium motions cancel each other out. And so we kind of restrict the allowed trajectories of our system. We restrict the ways in which our system can be moved by imposing conditions um, on that, on the system. So there are some things about this that look very familiar from thinking about principle theories, from thinking about special relativity as a principle theory, for example, um, in the 20th century, that kind of give us a conceptual way of conceptualizing what might be going on, and that can help us to ask questions um, about the theory and to think about theory in interesting ways. Um, so one thing we would immediately want to do would be to kind of clarify the axioms. We'd want to understand what's the relationship between the three principles of inertia, composition of motion and equilibrium and the general principle. So if you look in the literature, you'll see D'Alembert derives his general principle from these three axioms. And D'Alembert says, I derive my general principle. But it's not clear that he really does. Right? When you look at this and try to make it work, the general principle has seems to have more content in it than in those three axioms. So it seems to me, you know, he's articulating some concepts in those axioms that enable him to state the general principle. But there's more going on, there's more dynamics going in when you state the general principle. So it'd be nice to pull out what, you know, where the different dynam dynamical claims are going in in order for him to be able to state this general principle that is kind of restricting the kinematics of the space the systems are in. And we can ask, what's the epistemic status of the axioms and the general principle? So we're familiar from the Einstein case of thinking, well, these are kind of inductive over the generalizations they hold of all the phenomena. That's definitely not the justification that um, D'Alembert is giving us for his general principle. There's a different way of trying to justify the generality 
Is it a good way? I don't know, how does it compare? Does it enable us to think differently maybe about principle theories and how we justify those principles? So we can ask about the epistemic status of these um, principles. And then, oh, sorry. Um, as I was mentioning, we can take a look at each of these notions that D'Alembert argues for. He thinks that we have clarity. We think, he thinks we can get at them a priori, um, but all of them have dynamical information built into them. So we would want to ask, what is that? And can we kind of pull apart each of the different pieces and understand them? So just to give you an example, um, before we finish up, um, in his composition of motion, as he's arguing for the um, for the parallelogram rule for the addition of velocities, um, in there there's an assumption about a transformation rule between a resting frame and a moving frame, and this hides um, a relativity principle. There isn't an explicit relativity principle in theory. This is where we find something. It looks like that. We can try and articulate exactly what that relativity principle is committing to, what that's like. That same. Um, and then his principle of equilibrium, unsurprisingly, has all sorts of um, dynamical commitments within it. Um, again, he tries to argue for them, he tries to show that you know we can take them for granted, they're just, you know, they're clear, we can know them a priori, but there's a lot of stuff being packed in here. There's the introduction of um, virtual motions, there's assumptions about what happens when a body encounters an obstacle, all these kinds of things. He wouldn't say there are assumptions, but they are. So I think that once we work through all of this stuff, uh, my hope is that we'll be able to see the structure of this theory and see what conditions it places on whatever objects satisfy his theory. So this is the principal approach. We try to understand what conditions do the principles place on whatever it is that satisfies our theory, whatever it is that our theory is about. And that seems to me a really interesting way of thinking about um, down and bear's duties on dynamics. But I definitely don't want to say, oh, so it's a principle theory. I think that's a mistake. I don't think theories are either principle theories or constructive theories. We can just take either a principle approach or a constructive approach to thinking about a particular theory. And these give us different routes to thinking about what the objects of that theory are. I'm finishing up when I was late this morning. That excuse. So, some different things were going on in this. For me, they all hang together. I'm not sure how well they hung together um, today. But um, in the early 18th century, these constructive approaches to saying what the bodies are that are the subject matter of physics, these are what dominate. And Du Chatelet has a very thoroughly worked out account of this. In the mid 18th century, due to developments in mechanics, there's a really big challenge to physics as being the place, the right place, the best place, the kind of authoritative place for saying what bodies are, what the subject matter of, of, of yeah, what the nature of bodies is, and thereby what it is that mechanics is about. Um, and that um, forces us to think about whether we need more principles, it forces us to look at the theory of constrained motions. If we do that, if we really want to follow this through, um, then I think D'Alembert's treatise on dynamics is the next place to look. It's a really rich and interesting text. And that looking at it from a constructive perspective and from a principle perspective gives us a framework for trying to pull out what's philosophically interesting with respect to the problem of bodies in that text. That's it, thank you.